put on the screen share here once more. And uh, let's go here into how to find market data. Now, this is going to be very brief, but even some of the professional authors sometimes don't understand it because they spend their time writing, and that's, that's totally fine. So where to look for useful data? If you are on the Kindle store, there are usually three parts to the store that give you insights. So one is obviously, and most people use this, if you use the, if you use the, search, uh, the search bar and type something in, you get a certain number of search results, which is a little bit of a very inaccurate, but some indicator of competitiveness. How many search results you get, <coughs> excuse me, and the other part is the books involved will have a certain sales rank. Then you have on the left-hand side, on the Amazon side, bottom left, the browse categories. Once you browse there, that gives you information. Um, you have the individual product pages. Then you have the very best seller lists. And all of these contain different, different types of information. Well, first point I want to make is if you go onto an individual product page, many people don't understand this. On every, if you scroll down on a product page, there are always two pieces of information, and people get them confused. Um, one is the Amazon bestsellers rank. In this case, it's a book rank 25,000. And there's a category bestseller rank that says number four in uh, nonfiction sports, outdoors, and nature, hiking, and camping, walking. Let's assume that would be a number one in that category. The author says, hey, I'm a number one bestseller. And yes, legitimately so, because you are a number one in the category. But that doesn't mean you sell a lot, of, a lot of books. So what we see here is we really have to distinguish between the category bestseller rank and the, and the overall Amazon sales rank that basically tells you how well are you doing relative to all those other 5.4 million English speaking titles out there or actually 6 million plus Kindle titles in total. Very important point. So next time your fellow author says, hey, I'm the number one in blah, 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 asking, well, that's great, but how many copies do you sell a day? And so it is really that um, Amazon bestseller rank that you're interested in if you want to measure a book's performance. Now, also what many people miss is um, how does that bestseller rank come about? Um, so what we have here is very an interesting plot because here we monitor the book hour by the hour. So every little dot here is how the sales rank of a book moves up and down. So I'm pointing it out here on my screen. So in very simple terms, if we move over here to the left hand side of the picture where this very bad book jumps from sales rank 108,000 all the way up to 31,000, and then you see the sales rank decays again. So basically what happens is the only factor that influences the sales rank is purchases and downloads, not reviews, not, not anything else. The moment it is purchased or downloaded, that is what drives up the sales rank, and it's like a vote that is cast by somebody. And almost like in real, real politics, it's, it's a vote that decays in value over time, right? So if you voted for someone three days ago, it doesn't mean you vote for that person today. So basically every purchase is a vote, and um, the value of that vote diminishes by 50% tomorrow, another 50% tomorrow, half to the day after, the day after. So basically the value of that vote after mathematically after about 11 days is basically zero. So that means one sale and then it starts to king. If nobody else is doing something, it will further go down into oblivion. So that is how sales rank works. You have to constantly work at it. And it also shows you, if you want to assess the performance of the book, if you go onto the store, like right now that hour, well, and you say, oh, what a great book, what a great niche. Let me write in that, right? That's not the way to look at it. You have to look at things over time and they say, well, on average, that book here has a sales rank of around, what, what is it, 50,000, 40,000. Um, all right, not so good, yeah? That's how, how to look at the market. And uh, what you can then do is combine that with books out of a whole category. As said, there is a distinction on the left-hand side between search and browse categories. So if you search, it will tell you there's 35,000 billionaire romance novels or 
uh, more than 50,000 paranormal romance novels. And it contains information about the size of a category. So you get all the results display. Uh, it lists all the books, but be very careful there. They are not sorted by sales rank. There is also recency going into the algorithm. There's reviews. Um, even if you're logged in, it can distort the picture of what is being shown to you, right? So that is very important. Here you get the whole market, but it's not in order of sales rank. And if you use the bestseller list to look at books, then there you get the top of the market, but you have no indication of the supply side of that market. So these are the two tools you can use and which, which we use every day. And the whole philosophy is then that what you can do for one book, you can aggregate the data for a group of books, which could be an author's portfolio monitored over time or a, a certain category or a certain search results. Or what becomes for us more and more interesting is any custom grouping where you say, well, there is no category for female protagonist thrillers, but let's look at all the thrillers and then run the book descriptions and titles against the database of 16,000 female first names and look at the relative proportion of female versus male pronouns in the book descriptions to filter out female protagonist thrillers, you get the idea, and then you can ass assess that type uh, of the market. So a little bit of theory, but you know, this is where the, uh, where as an author you can get so, the data from. So just so I understand that, when you're doing some of your research, is that something you're doing? You're filtering, like you would go and filter deeper in to like book descriptions? Um, yes, that's that's basically the whole essence because basically what, what we do is, well, there's two types of data we use. One part of the data, uh, which I'm gonna show you now open the bolt of it, is our category database. So here the data is aggregated by category. That gives you a first indicator and very clearly can show you how, say, clean and wholesome romance is doing much better than uh, gardening and horticulture growing bond size. When it gets a bit, little more granular, we obviously have the problem with also sometimes category pollution, that there are certain books and categories that don't belong there. So there's a bit of a, uh, you know, it's, it's a first crude measure, but a very effective measure. Mm -hmm. Then when it gets into finer research, the issue is if you type in something like female protagonist thrillers into the search bar, you're presented with an endless number of books, but the search engine of Amazon is extremely poor in terms of what they render. 50% of the search results have nothing to do with what you're actually looking for. So therefore the answer is yes. When we produce a genre report on, for example, um, serial killers, or we recently did one on post-apocalyptic and dystopian sci-fi, we are basically weeding through each and every book description of thousands and thousands of books um, to have to look for the occurrence of like post-apocalyptic words that really have to appear. Otherwise, the chances are it's never going to be post-apocalyptic novels. So, you know, EMP attack, the, the, the time after the uh, apocalypse, you know, there's words and phrases. So we run the data of the books against certain phrases and words that you really say if that is that book that has to occur in the title or book description otherwise it's the likelihood of it being in the jar is very very low uh, i i did not understand that you were doing that kind of layered um filtering and i think that that's super important for folks that are watching this to understand that you're you're able to you know feather through that and find out that you know more than just a generalization of what Amazon's throwing at you, you're saying, okay, um, let me help you as an author sift through a lot of Amazon's noise. It, it, exactly. It's a lot of work, but the insights generated are, I think, very nice. I mean, if, if time allows, and I think we don't really have the time limits here on YouTube. No, we don't. <laughs> we can, I can let us show you actually this um, – it's what we call virtual bestseller list because the bestseller list of the Amazon that you're presented with from Amazon are only as good as bad as the categorizations of the books. So is the search result, which is as good as bad as the search engine and the 
keywords and 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 basically the search engine is only looking uh, in other products of Amazon into the keywords into the book title and the rumor goes only in the first 255 words of the book description if at all and at a lower part of the of the search algorithm so this search engine of Amazon, even the advanced search, is by no means as, as advanced as the advanced search uh, you have on the Google en engine. And we try to compensate for that when we say, let's do a report on serial killer thrillers. We really want to have serial killer thrillers and not whatever thrillers Amazon throws at you, or legal thrillers for that matter. Right, so hey, why don't we talk about some uh, genres and market niches? We talked a lot about uh, the overall supply and demand. Let's get a bit more concrete. What many uh, authors, especially new in the industry, don't understand is that if you look at the highest selling genres, um, when we talk ebooks, it is basically three markets that make the market it is romance, it is mystery, thriller, suspense, and sci fi and fantasy. Now, then you have the big umbrella category nonfiction, which breaks down to thousands of niches. Then you have teen, young, adult, and then you already see, we earlier said religion and spirituality, you know, is the biggest single genre when it comes to the book supply. But look at here, it's by far not the single biggest genre when it comes to the book demand. And this is where you start getting this mismatch. We saw also this huge amount of children in books, but see, even the well, the top 100 of the category have like an average sales rate of around 2,000. Fair enough. But then you have a very steep drop off, which very soon goes down to zero. So this is where the where the data can show you both what to write, but in the same way, it can show you what not to do. Right. So you have here at the very top level i mean look at this we saw how many law books there are but you know even if you're in the top 100 you sell on average perhaps five or six books a day so which however can be very lucrative because i saw books about maritime law which cost 200 dollars. So yeah <laughs> there's a case for that too yeah it's like some of those accounting books are 150 bucks right it, exactly right so there's always uh the price uh part in the equation as well then um, we can start looking in trends and this is like a completely arbitrary trend where again it makes the point if you go into the store at any point in time and you just you know look at the store say <coughs> right here in May 2016 and you see literature and fiction erotica up there well it's only a measure in a point in time and you see that what happens over time, we know Amazon is limiting the way you can market erotica on it, it's suppressing. Uh, I think you're not allowed to do ads for it. And the whole erotica genre, you know, is going down. While at the same time, um, Amazon back, we won this work this back in February um, 2016, introduced this clean and wholesome romance category, which has been like super thriving ever since, as people started to get tired of Fifty Shades of Grey type of stuff and steamy stuff. Mm. Um, so I'm not arguing that you shouldn't write steamy romans. I'm not arguing you should uh, you should write clean and wholesome. What I'm arguing is um, changes in the book market don't happen over time. Uh, sorry, don't happen overnight, and especially not from one hour to the next. And what I see many people do is jump onto Amazon look at the bestseller list and say, oh, right, I'm now going to write ketogenic diet books, right? <laughs> you know, that is not how, how the markets work. They, 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 they have evolutions over time. Yeah, and you know, what, I, what I would say, I think there are some folks that are in, that are in the market as authors that are very good at genre jumping, right? Yeah. They, they, that's their skill. That's their superpower. And the ones that I know that are doing that, they're, they're ahead of trends, right? They're, they're looking at this kind of data and they're seeing where things are going and they're, and they're actually, um, you know, putting out test product there very quickly. And when they see it works, then they can follow it up with more. And when they don't, 
they're very agile and can get out of those markets quickly. So I, I bring that up to say that um, if that's something you, you know, a lot of people want to jump from thing to thing that you may show them, it's like understand there are people that are good at that, that it gets back to your other point about it has to marry up with what you're passionate about, right? Very right. Very right. Yeah, I, I think solely jumping genres uh, where you're not knowledgeable. I, I, I once had an interesting discussion with these really verse harem authors, and I think they they crucified me because in a side sentence I'm, I mentioned, you know, when we analyzed that niche, well, you know, at the end of a reverse harem, the protagonist, you know, never chooses between uh, the boys, you know, that are after her or uh, protecting her or supporting her. And I said, well, but, you know, you're an artist. You can write whatever you want. And I was literally crucified, you know, because how can you dare say this? And it's not a reverse harm. You know, I mean, you have to be passionate about and knowledgeable uh, about what you do. Otherwise, it's, it, it, don't, it won't work in the long run, right? Even if you use Ghostwriter, how, how do you quality assure what the Ghostwriter is putting on? Well, the latest the reviews will tell. And, and just, you know, for the sake of it, from the high side, what are the worst selling categories? You know, as bad as it can get. Uh, I love this, you know, nonfiction, crafts, hobbies, and home, crafts and hobbies, woodworking, Decoys, decoys, right? Yeah, decoy. yeah. And I had to look it up. A duck decoy, decoy is a man-made object re resembling a real duck. Duck decoys are sometimes used in duck hunting to attract real ducks. Yeah. Well, great. You can be a number one bestseller in that category very easily, but you will probably earn more money selling than hunting rifles based on the authority or the decoys than by selling the actual book just to drive that store at home. <laughs> right, and and then we can go to the to the next level down. That's where it now gets more interesting for the more professional authors. Um, if you look in our database, as I think this month's data, even on the subcategory level, it's still very crude, right? Because you have here um, things like uh, women's fiction at the very top, which is predominantly romance, contemporary fiction, genre fiction. So there, you still have very broad umbrella categories. And then you see. MTS uh, playing a major role, uh, and then and then it gets fast, more granular. Still, a couple of big umbrella categories like fantasy overall, historical fiction overall. But it gives you a feel. The reason children's ebook in the, is up here so fast because there's still some tail tailwind from the Christmas season, um, but that's going to vanish here very soon. And uh, this is at the the very top end of the market. You can see how it falls off. And you can basically plot this for like, you know, seven, 7,000 um, jars or so. So, you know, at any point in time, you know, when we look at the market, you can drill down and down and down. And that gives you in the end, um, I think, good news. You know, opportunities, opportunities abound. Let's mm -hmm. jump into those opportunities are a little more here for the professional authors that, that watch this and the beginners for that matter. So once you drill down to the niche market level, the good news is really you have opportunities abound for authors. So if we take my favorite analogy here of the, uh, the, the stars in the sky and every little dot, every little star is an opportunity, a potential opportunity of a book market niche you want to write for, then literally the, the, the sky is is the limit. So if we wanted to turn these every little star into a into a book market, let's say every little star is a category in Amazon. And you put all those stars in the sky, one sheet of paper, then it would basically look like this. So people usually go like, oh my God, you know. Um, people who know Calytics, you know, this is our tra trademark, the, uh, the stars in the sky, the Milky Way picture. But, it, but it's very simple. I'll come back to it in a second. But what you have here is basically two things being measured. Book sales, that's the part of goal as measured by the sales rank. So the better the sales rank, the better the sales. And the number of competing books as some measure, not even as some measure or indicator of the degree of competition, right? And so on that very map, you find a green zone 
where you have you know very good sales rank so it will be high up on the chart and if it's further to the left of the chart you have like low competition so not so many dudes who are after you <laughs> and competing with you so that is the books the categories in the green zones and you have somewhere in the middle and some in the dark orange or red which are usually those markets where you either the sales are very low and or the competition is exceedingly high right so and that gives you that uh, picture that we just uh, just looked at let me just move back here so the stars every dot is a category and then from there you can plot it on one picture and here you now have the dots right so right. where you see in the, the the green zone that would be a, a book where you have a very attractive sales rank, say here it's a sales rank of around say 1,000, and the the number of titles in the category are around 2,000 if you look look at the graph. So just for those who uh, have difficulties with with the numbers and graphs, it's, it's really simple. So you would have here one category, Romance Gothic, which has a sales rank of roughly you know 1,800. It's a pretty good sales rank across the top 20 titles. And there are like 2,000 titles in the category, right? Like right here. On the other end of the spectrum, you have about the same level of sales rank in the erotica literature and fiction erotica, romantic erotica category. But you see there at the point in time, we're already 160,000 titles because that was also one of these categories which was heavily abused by Indian click farms and you name it, and Amazon not not policing it right so you have here a sample for a category where the sales in one category are 75 uh, times less competitive at the same level of sales now is this truly gothic romance we want, then did a in-depth analysis the, mentioning the approach using the approach earlier mentioned well what came out here also there not everything is like real gothic roman a lot of it is like dark or darker romance but even if the categorization is not like super accurate, you get a hint of where to look at, you know, mm. what is selling and what may not be too overly crowded, right? And you basically can work the graph the other way around where you say you have here two examples of two markets or two categories where the number of titles is around the same. So here's teen young adult literature and fiction school and education with about 1,100 titles and a given sales rank of 6,300. Then at the same level of competition, you have here education reference study aids, same number of titles, but a much, much, much worse sales rank. In fact, uh, 22 copies a day versus one, one copy a day. So just to illustrate, and as you start using this, you start getting what we call the the health of a whole genre. So if we talk romance as an example, this is the plot only of the romance categories within the main romance category. There are many others which we also plot which are outside of the romance category where you go into whatever religion and spirituality, Christian fiction slash romance. Uh, that's not plotted here. These are just the main um, uh, romance one. I think I also have teen young adult in there. So as an example here, Something like tea, clean and wholesome romance, you know, somewhere here. Compare that with paranormal romance, which is like, a, yeah, it's a super market. It's one of the highest selling romance markets. It's in fact hot mainstream. Hot mainstream meaning the sales are even better, but so is competition. You see competition is around at 80,000 titles in just that uh, one umbrella category. So. One can make very conscious decisions, say, well, I don't care. I have a, I know how to do ads and how to do them well. I have an ad budget. Mm -hmm. So I don't shy away of going into the paranormal romance market. And in fact, I'm going uh, I'm, I'm to crush it there, right? But if you're a beginning author, no clue about ads, uh, no clue about marketing and newsletters, no readership, well, it's not probably not the first market you, you want to get uh, get into to make yourself a name if you get the idea and add to that the equation of how things move over time so for example here teen young adult 
fiction, science fiction, dystopian, you know, the Bella Forest niche genre, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, on the back of the Hunger Games and all that stuff. Um, it's performing still extraordinarily well, but you also have to look at it over time where you see this is the sales rank monitored over time where you can see back in May 2015, that's at the back, at the tail end of this, I think, whole Hunger Games divergent mm. maze runner type of, type of thing, right? And you see that blockbuster is sort of going down and now... You know, we see, however, if you only look at the peaks and valleys, you don't see much. But if you start putting it through a trend line, it, it looks like this. And actually, we look at Google trends in parallel for the same period of time. You see the same hockey stick. So these are early indicators of, hey, could there be a little, uh, you know, it's already sound well, but could there be another push for uh, sci-fi dystopian? Then you look on Netflix, you look at... Uh, you know, the dystopian side at uh, Handman's Tale and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. That's a bit of a different genre. But you see how the whole dystopian theme has gained traction again over, over the last year. You, you get the idea. Yeah. Um, and this may be um, not completely relevant, but a thing you made me think about when you mentioned some of the things there. So within a – have you had any analysis of within a particular – niche how an author may perform based on how they've saturated that niche so um, an example being like you said Bella Forest and in, in that particular while there's um, in, in, in the other in the, what do you call it hot mainstream there there's a lot more titles in her in that particular genre of dystopian while there's less titles, her percentage of those titles may be really significant. Have you ever looked at anything like that, or can you talk to that? Yeah, I mean, there are certain, uh, absolutely. I mean, if we, if we look at, um, I think one good example is, let's take Cozy Mystery. For example, we've been monitoring the Cozy Mystery market for almost five years now, um, do, a, and do a report, you know, every year on the, on the very very market just looking here on my screen whether I can put one out because it illustrates this in a, in a in a very nice way so within cozy mystery for example let's take this as an example actually so let me resume the share you're digressing here a bit but you know I think it's worthwhile because uh, this way we really get to the, to the root of things so, you know, when we look at, at a market such as Cozy Mystery and they're, you know, creating these um, bestseller lists, I'm jumping here um, to exactly that point you mentioned earlier, you know, where we take like a whole number of 24,000 search results for Cozy Mystery, but then try to really boil it down to what are really Cozy Mystery titles. We're down to like 7,000, excluding many others. And that then gives you, you know, market values and all sorts of things. But the one interesting thing is we started then looking at top performing, excuse me, top performing authors here in, in Cozy Mystery, right? Right here. So, and then you start ranking these authors. First of all, you see a bit, is it traditional publishers or is it self-publishers? And when, then we started adding this analysis was that author already in the in that list when we did it a year ago? And you see here, yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. So you see how, especially Cozy Mystery is an example where once you then start, you know, clicking onto the individual authors, you know, from here you then uh, can get going. Is you start looking what they do and how how consistent they are in, in what uh, what they start doing it's um, it's very interesting and some of these are um, come and go but you see how consistent the the performance is and then the next question is well what do they do to to have that performance well if you then dive into what type of tropes and stuff they look at you start noticing ah oh, there is like witches witches and witches and then you start sifting out, okay, 
they have really found a niche with it, which is paranormal uh, cozy mystery. And within paranormal cozy mystery, they then go, we then did a deep dive on just witches. And this is where you then get, you know, a market which is like $200,000 a month, which is then dominated by um, a list of, you know, a handful of authors, you know, who, who've been there in and out, year in, year out, dominating such a very, such a very niche. And then if you start looking, well, what do they do? What are their book descriptions? What are the tropes they use? What are the covers? And, and here you have it, you know. Um, these people carve out a market of its own right. Uh, I think great in in bringing the classic paranormal reader who may have read, I don't know, perhaps even some, some romance and paranormal stuff, I'm not so sure about that, but just hypothesizing, to then carve out um, a market in its, in its own right, just as, um, just as one example. No, that's, that's great. Um, I hope folks that are watching this see the power of what you're doing, um, that this is what we kind of opened up with. It's, it's, it's not just, it's, it's more than just a model of what's going on in the marketplace. You're actually starting to um, tease out information that can be relevant to how you uh, approach the market with your product, right? Like it's, um, doesn't mean you have to change your writing style, but if you, you know, if you, it's just like whenever you have an interaction with people, if you just, you know, there's all kinds of psychological studies about how you start to mimic their speaking behavior and using the same kind of words is if you start doing that with your customers, right. guess what? They will like your product more. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, you have to look at you know, the authors who are already out there. What are they doing? Uh, another good example, for example, for, for trends right now, I mean, uh, the, the, the core mystery thriller writers greatly complain about this because, hey, there are suddenly some ladies writing, writing want-to-be mystery thrillers, but they're, these mystery thrillers are just romance in disguise. And perhaps they are, but they sell like crazy, right? So... So you, you get from here into things like romantic mystery and suspense, you know, the, the sale, the, the, the trend line going up left, right, and center, you then start digging into it, and you see all of a sudden there's like two, three authors who've been hired by the Montlake Amazon imprint, and they're plastering, plastering the, the bestseller lists in, in that very genre. You know, have, have a look for yourself. Very interesting. A qu this is just kind of you and I talking here. <laughs> With, um, do you think that the guys at Amazon Imprint are doing this kind of analysis to decide who to get on board? Um, I frankly don't. We, we had the discussion when we did our annual Clean and Wholesome Romance uh, report where many of the top, well, not many, but a couple of the key top authors were uh, Montlake romance authors and it was sort of funny um, because when we when we did the analysis I, I think in a, in a video or so I, I sort of mentioned in passing and just uh, I mentioned in passing well I'm just wondering how Amazon imprints are, are doing uh, doing so well you know and I did not mention like do they get preferential preferential treatment or anything like it I was posing question um you know this is really great what what's what, what's happening there so how, how come and um well what happened there was that we got into a discussion with, with one of the authors it was um basically here was back in the 2000 in the 2018 study and just showing you she, because she did answer to that very very question here, right? So, um, in that clean and wholesome romance, which, by the way, is like a super um, increase in sales ever, ever since that that started. So, not to sell here anything on this webinar, but where where is she? It was here. Sarah Wilson. She is um, she is one of the you know big, 
at the time. I don't know whether she's still there. I, I hope so. She's one of the, the Mont Blake authors, and she said, you know, just finished w watching your video. I said, maybe the reason that Mont Blake books have such a high number of retentions on lists is due to the fact that no one beats Amazon when it comes to marketing. Yeah. <laughs> And they heavily market books years after they've been initially released, unlike every traditional publisher out there who treats new, uh, new books like produce. They only pushed and promote, promoted a very short time on when they left and then let them wither and die. Montley takes a long tail view when it comes to marketing, which makes them unique. And then instead of assuming that some strange thing must be going on. Perhaps you should be looking at the type of marketing that's taking place and who's doing that marketing along with their strategy. So I, I found this a very interesting answer. And another thing is, yes, if they do look at data, they, um, they, they at least have the data to also judge who to take on board. And obviously, they're very close to the indie talent to judge who to take on board. But right now, we see a lot of Amazon imprints in the top of the best seller lists, no doubt. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, you think about it. Like, if it was Joe and Alex consulting and we were out there trying to work with traditional publishers, we would be saying, hey, if you want to start really growing your business, you could use this data to go find niches ahead of time and find authors to go pick up, right? Absolutely, especially also the author list and, and all the reports. We, and, uh, who are the top authors in that very niche? If, if I was a publisher, and I'm not, but I would be watching for that talent. Whether those successful indie authors are in them, though, <clears throat> for, a, for a traditional publisher contract is a, on another sheet of paper, right? So Right, right. But it just makes me think that, you know, I know the people that Amazon has hired at management level, right? You probably know some of them too, and they're, they're not foolish people. They're probably using some of this same information to figure out these markets. I, I, absolutely. And, uh, you know, look, looking at the time, you know, just going here briefly yeah, to sure, the rest, sure. we'll have a bit of a discussion. Um, I think we're almost through the data part here. So, you know, science fiction and fantasy are also an interesting market. It looks a bit different from, from romance. The, the commonality is there's a lot of stuff in the green zone. And you mentioned, like, Craig's example earlier, right? Like, science, military science fiction. You see what happened exactly there is the sales are still high up there. But if I plotted this over time where the green dot came from, basically move from mm. what was a niche here into... Well, you can argue 10,000 titles in the category is already mainstream, but the fact is the things keep moving to the right. The big question is, do they stagnate in sales? Do they drop down or do they go up? And with some of these green dots in the hot cells, you know, they continue to not just move up in the level of competition, they continue to move up in the level of sales. Others just do a horizontal movement and basically end up in oblivion in uh, after a couple of years in somewhere in the big main, mainstream. And that's obviously the thing you want to avoid. And what I don't have with me today, but if you if you go on Google Trends, you know, type in paranormal romance in, in Google Trends and, and give you let it give you the plot over 14 years. And you know exactly what's happening in the jar. There's a huge upturn, you know, over four, five, six years, I think peaking out in 2000. 13, 14, and then slowly declining again. So the trends don't happen overnight. So also your books are not written overnight. That's the good news. Longer term trends come together with longer term projects. All right. So uh, just to close off also for the just in fantasy is one example. The categories are a first crude measure. So there is a category such as science fiction, fantasy, fantasy humorous, and you say, well, is it now really humorous factor, uh, fantasy in it? Then you obviously start looking into the books, and you say, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure whether all the books are correctly categorized, but you at least see what is driving the performance, and you see some urban fantasy authors in there, with urban fantasy, with, where you can argue, well, it could fit in, in humorous fantasy. 
You have game lit, lit RPG guys in there who very often have also a humorous part to the whole game lit in it. Yeah. So that's at least how you can start exploring things. And for those of you who are in mystery, thriller, suspense, there's a good and bad news. The good news is if we look just at the sub and sub sub categories in mystery, thriller, suspense on Kindle, they are all in the green zone, right? It's, it's really a great market. The bad news is it's also heavily contested by the traditionals. But even if you go into some, we did a study on legal thrillers, and you go in there, lots of indies doing really well and, you know, applying their knowledge in that niche and, and, and succeeding. And, uh, you know, things, and things go up and down. You have police procedurals going up. Last year it was serial killers. It showed a great development. I think this year we see again female protagonist thrillers, non-cozy, doing extremely well. Um, we see domestic thrillers as a new category that has uh, seen uh, a good uh, side. So that's what's happening uh, o o overall. And I'm sorry if we haven't covered it in depth, but as we have a discussion, um, uh, Joe, we can still have a look in the database and into nonfiction. Nonfiction overall has not seen the level of supply as fiction on candle. Sorry, not level of demand as fiction mm -hmm. and more supply. But also good news here over the last 18 months, nonfiction is seeing a bit of an upward trend. But mind you, the very graph analysis we showed at the beginning of the discussion, these format penetrations and genre, if you are in self-help and business books, don't forget that print books and increasingly audiobooks have to be a main part of the strategy. The ebook alone is not going to get you very far. Right, right. And, um, you know, I'm, I think on that, with the nonfiction piece, it's a different market per se. And um, like with my work, right, it's, the book is one, one way for people to understand what my, my knowledge base and my authority is but there's other products that I'm probably trying to get people to do, whether it's I'm looking to speak or I'm looking to sell e-courses or whatever it might be, right? So I think it's hard for you to glean what is that book as part of a total strategy, right? Exactly. That, that's a very important point. And, you know, if we take a closer look here just for, for the sake of it here in the database, so if uh, this is now the, the data from this month, right? So some 7,000 genres. So if you start saying, mm, uh, you know, let, let's write books about marketing, right? Or let's, no, let's uh, do the gardening example. You start saying, let's, let's write a book about gardening as a, as a nonfiction book. And you look for the term gardening to show up in any part of the, in any part of the category designation. So whether, you know, if you, if you drill it down, it, you know, the gardening part can be part of the category or it can be part of the subcategory or it comes up in the sub subcategory or even level four, level five. Right? And when you see, you can say, hey, I want to be the expert here in the category for, uh, what is it here? Crafts, hobbies, and home um, as, as one example. Crafts, hobbies, and home, gardening, and horticulture, flowers, orchids. I'm sure there's experts out there for orchids. But look at this. The average sales rank across the top 20 titles for that one is 270,000, 72,000. So about three titles, 0 0.3 books or downloads a day. Mm. The average number one rank for the title. But this is where the authority thing comes in. The average, and very important, I know you can use online tools and just look at the thing, but you also want to sustain it over time. So this is monitored here over a month. The average sales rank of the first position, the number one position in that category is 18,000. So let's say whatever, six, seven at the most uh, uh, a day. Price level pretty decent with $5.91. But you see, if you look at the competition number of titles, well, only 100 books in there. So you can make for yourself the judgment, hey, is this something that can form part of my overall strategy as an expert for orchids? And in a certain way, you can do this in 
in fiction, obviously, as well. But uh, what I do want to show people is as soon as you start typing things like um, getting into self-help and these sort of things, be aware, you know, if, if we just take the books on self-help, the main category uh, self-help here on Kindle, and I know there are so many indie authors who say, hey, that's, well, I'm going to make a big living up there. And we just sorted it by ascending order of sales rank. So these are the highest. So the highest selling books in that category, let me make it smaller here. So self-help motivational, right? That's where everybody wants to jump in because they want to be the next, what is it, Kobe? If <laughs> uh, Kobe or other motivational ones. Well, yes. At the very top end, you know, the top 20 titles, there are 70 books that are to be earned. But, you know, look at that. The number of titles is 43,000 in it. Uh -huh. mm. So that's the judgment you have to make. And, you know, if we explode the list here of, of categories, there are probably about three, 4,000 nonfiction categories in it. Well, and the, okay. the disparity by around. The disparity between what you saw in sales there for the average rank and the 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 you know the high rank there is like shocking, right? Like yeah, <laughs> I mean obviously if you are on Amazon, the number one title, if you are the number one, if, if you're the number one guy in self help or you're the number one guy in business books, I mean that's where the big boys are out there who have the hard covers. And soft covers in the airports, right? So, mm -hmm. so uh, yes, there are. However, there is also a couple of sticky titles out there. You know, uh, whatever the big themes are, habits and that sort of stuff. But even there, once you start looking into the real level of sales, or, or go into business and marketing books, yeah. Um, I mean, that's our, our realm here as well, right? If you if you just ask the cross category because marketing books are say entrepreneurship i have authors who want to go into into entrepreneurship the the number of categories that entail the term entrepreneurship mm. um, are in total like well 32 of them right so you see there's stuff about book advertising management startups so the guy says i want to write a book about how to run startups well, the average sales rank across the top 20 is about, you know, 15, 17 books a day. That is, however, in an ocean of books of how many? Well, 3,000, you know, and taking both the level of sales, level of competition together actually puts it into a hot niche. So that's at least a starting point where you can, can start looking. But at the same point in time, if you are the expert for mail order marketing, well, probably not so. That's right. You, you, you get the idea. So yeah, yeah. that's how it's, how it's being worked. Interesting. So I, I think I didn't have the screen share on this, just show you the data. So if you filter for anything that mentions entrepreneurship anywhere in the category path, you end up here with these. Um, with these 32 categories, so ranging, you find them in business and money and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. You see here what I was just mentioning. So let's see what would be the, the highest selling uh, categories in that one, smallest. So yeah, entrepreneurship, small business, it is a big theme, right? And however, there's 46,000 titles in it, right? Wow. So that's... Yeah. So you have to niche it down. So as I just said, if you are a specialist in startups here, you have, yeah, sales are already not so high, but there's been all, only 3,000 in the category. And if you niche it even further down into business and money, home-based selling, um, the sales are, well, three books a day, you know, in the top 20, but there's only 300, sorry, uh, 300 titles in it. So that is how you can basically also judge a bit for yourself as an entrepreneur and investor, as an entrepreneur and investor, well, do you want to go for the big money, but then you have to also have the big bucks for the advertising and the project, you know, or do you want to go for the niche? That, that is always the question, right. both in fiction and in non-fiction, I presume. 
Yeah, uh, it's something I've noticed on the nonfiction side that, um, you know, it's especially some of the categories that you've mentioned is like money and um, financial plan. It's some of those folks that are, you know, you have to understand that there's a lot of books and you're going up against Susie Orman, right? right. Who is, it's not just the books that are motivating the sales there. It's a whole brand and, but the other, conversely, if that's what you're trying to do with your business as a nonfiction authority or, you know, whatever it is that you're consulting on, this is uh, an important part of building that brand, right? You, this is, you know, Amazon is the, for all intents and purposes, the, the third largest search engine. So people are going to come here to look for topics and authority. And if you're not here, are you an authority? I I, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. And, and in a way, you know, you can also argue to my mind that what is an authority in nonfiction is like the, the lead author or one amongst the lead authors in a certain fiction genre, right? So you mentioned military sci-fi and, you know, there are certain guys there lit RPG. There are certain guys there who are like dominated and they're viewed as the quote unquote authorities in those markets mm -hmm. so I think this whole authority uh, authority thing uh, whether you call it a lead author or the top author in fiction the authority in nonfiction I think it applies to um, it applies to both both realms and the good news is in both realms the the indie authors can can succeed and in you know my last oh yeah point was <laughs> You know, just to summarize, you know, what do you do with all of this? Uh, we started off with this whole discussion around the market and how you're exposed to market forces. So once you're an indie author, you're, an, you're a publisher. Once you're a publisher, you're in business. Once you're in business, you operate in the market. The market comes with competition, and the market comes with a certain level of demand. And that's, uh, that's where you uh, live in, right? So I hope you... You guys in, enjoyed this, and uh, you know, for those of you who want to find out a, a little more or even download that presentation, I'm going to set up here this page for business of writing. So we have kalytics.com slash BOW where you can download the presentation um, in case you want to have, have it uh, as a closer read. And you know, by all means, um, do check us out, and uh, I, you know, we have the database, we have these genre reports, um, and I look forward to uh, welcoming you if you if you if you check it check it out. In any case, I just hope that you found this discussion useful. I know looking at numbers does not come uh, as second nature to every artist, and I hope you still had some fun anyway. So. Yeah, could you kind of get into that a little deeper? Like, I know you and I, we could look at that Excel spreadsheet, and I'm like, wow, you make an awesome spreadsheet. Um, and I'd start asking you questions about your lookup tables and stuff. But, like, how are you helping uh, those that aren't going to be really geeking out about this to digest this information in an easy way? I know you mentioned these reports. I know you have subscriptions. Like, how, how if I'm an author, like, um, let's say I'm, um, you know, I'm a steampunk author and I want to start bringing your um, marketing material into um, how I market. How would I go about like starting to do that? Like what's the entry points and like how can I apply it? Right. Well, the, the entry point is that we, the, we basically serve, you know, beginning in the authors and professional and, and published authors for that matter all the way down to publishing firms so obviously these are very different needs mm -hmm. uh, although it's interesting to see that even you know some beginning indie authors want to jump right into the database right and, and look at it every month there are these people so but uh in simple terms what you can do is if you go to our site um or i can even show show you around there there are these um there are what we call these genre reports, right? So if you're just interested in, you say, you've always been a post-apocalyptic and dystopian author, mm -hmm. and you don't want to change that, um, then you would go to our website and basically just have a look at, um, at individual reports. 
that, that you can buy. Let me just have a look here. Yeah, you may have up. to share the screen. It's still on the yeah, let me, slide let me show. Share the screen for you. So, you know, if you go to the Catalytics website, there is a section called Shop. And there you are able to just look at individual genres. So and there's two types of genre reports. The ones would be things like this here, romance, mystery, thriller, suspense, or sci-fi fantasy, where the question is more out of the 100 sci-fi categories, which ones are doing particular well as opposed to others. So this one gives you every six months, um, well, you, you pay every six months, but you would uh, buy a genre report that gives you all pertinent information from uh, what are the best categories, the highest sound ones, which are trending up, which are trending down, what are the average price levels, who are the top authors, who are the top publishers in the segment, um, you know, in a certain way. If you are into, so that's what's happening in, a, in such a genre report. If you are into, say, we had the example um, let's take post-apocalyptic and dystopian, right? So if you are just into post-apocalyptic and dystopian, you would go for one of these special reports that then just go into that very one genre and say, okay, who are the top guys there? What are the top books? What's trending up? What's trending down? Are there certain tropes? You know, what is selling more, EMP and solar attacks or zombies and viruses? So that is the type of analysis we, mm -hmm. we do in these type of genre reports. So that is one pillar um, of our service. And the other pillar of the service is the database that I showed you. The database uh, ranges from, um, you know, it's basically a downloadable Excel sheet because we found people want to manipulate, save the data, etc. And that one comes in two levels. One is the premium level, which goes from category down to subcategory level, covering 420 categories. And then this here is the premium edition, which goes now down to level five sub subcategory. So um, if you are into nonfiction business, investing, entrepreneurship, small business, management, you know, that is the level you get there. And this is a monthly subscription, or you can do annual ones. That is the second pillar of our service. And the third is we do both for authors and for professional publishers, which are uh, custom-made projects. So there we would basically generate these reports on very specific niches. So uh, people say, well, we want to have like the report on say alpha male romance. Mm -hmm. And we really look at whatever 20, 30,000 alpha male romance books and then find out, well, what is it? Is it the, motorcycle romance the biker is it the paranormal alpha male is it this one you know what tropes are generating the highest royalties in a certain niche and together with it what is the level of competition in these niches uh, it's really interesting um because you know one of the things i talk to most authors when they're first getting started is you know the best place to put their money is you know, an excellent book cover, an excellent editor. You know, you, it, when you're first getting started, you really need to make sure that you're have really high product quality, right? Right. But, and, and, well, why? One of the things that's behind that, and where this is typically comes from, is when an author will come, like at the conference, they're like, "Hey, do I need to set up a business? Do I need to do this?" It's like, no, you shouldn't put your money into setting up an LLC in the United States. You need to get that, right. that money into your book. Well, and a big part of that is you need to get a book in the market to find out, is there a market for your book? But what right. I think is interesting here with what you have with those entry level products, like 37 bucks, you know, if I was going to go into a particular niche, that would be helpful before you write the book just to kind of help you understand that market and maybe it'll help you make some slight adjustments to things that are going to have a big boost like your title or so, like you said some of the trope data that you guys look at exactly right so um you know to make it a little more concrete i mean it's it's quite a while where is this one um 
The only thing I would just caution authors looking at this, don't fall into analysis paralysis. Don't be like, I got to get it. Right? Like, and, and our whole point is actually to make this, uh, to make this whole thing also like very, uh, very, very actionable. That is actually what we have in mind because it doesn't, obviously it doesn't help you if you then spend, uh, spend no time writing. <laughs> um, <laughs> But let, let me, you know, take one example here, which was the, uh, let's take this, this just for argument's sake, the post-apocalyptic uh, fiction one, right? So people also get a bit better feel. We looked at cozy mystery. So you have the overall, say, sci-fi report. Let me share the screen here again. Let's say the case is this. You, you looked at the overall sci-fi data and you see, ah, oh, here the post-apocalyptic one is actually an interesting market you know not too crowded not too big but i see all that zombie stuff i see handman's tail on the dystopian side i still see bella forest with her gender games and whatever dystopian uh, romance stuff succeeding right so then you say okay i really want to understand what's what's going on in that market so here we did one just as an example with the share so let's say from the database or from one of the overall genre report, you start saying, hey, I'm, I'm interested in post-apocalyptic and dystopian. And all the other genre reports look, look a bit the same, so you get an impression of what is, what is in there. So we would, and I'm, you know, there's 80 pages, so I'm not going to go <laughs> all the details. But, you know, sometimes we not only look at, uh, we not only look at, the quantitative information, but also give a little bit of a structured information. What is actually dystopian versus post-apocalyptic, which is often used very interchangeably, but it's actually two different things with, with overlap. So how then do the two different things perform over time? Where are they on that map? And you see here, you know, back in 2015, the dystopian sci-fi category was still a niche category and then sort of you had moved over into the mainstream. So you need to equip yourself with what is happening, what is happening here in that thing. Also similar thing here between 2015 and 2018 for post-apocalyptic. So if you then dig into it, well there are other niches. So take Bella Forest, you know, she's in the teen young adult dystopian, which is still high selling niche market. So <coughs> excuse me. So we're looking at that sort of stuff. So lots of trend data. What is dystopian doing on Google as opposed to ap apocalyptic books? And looking at long-term evolutions. So here, by the way, um, you see how dystopian you know, has really continued to grow all, all the way up here. We look at these short-term stuff. What has happened to the preppers market and the survival as a market for the post-apocalyptic people. And that is what we do. And then you find out, well, dystopian is actually only a quarter of the market where, by the way, we mentioned earlier that approach, you know, we sifted through all book descriptions for, for terms like fertility, gender, birth rate, oppression, regime, society, elite supremacy, hegemony, you know, all these words that you typically find in the description of a true dystopian novel as opposed to a post-apocalyptic novel that just uses the word dystopian in the title title as a marketing gimmick, right? So what is real dystopian versus post-apocalyptic? And uh, you know, here you mentioned tropes, you know, who are top authors in the segment, top publishers. And here it becomes interesting because then we usually analyze in a quantitative way Submarkets and tropes, you know, looking for books that have mention of, say, EMP, ele electromagnetic, blackout type of books, as opposed to books where the post apocalypse is some storm or some virus or bacteria, to start ranking these books to see, well, what are actually the tropes that gener ultimately generate the highest total royalties that are currently being paid out there in the system. And last but not least, you know, we look at word clouds, also some keyword stuff. And then, you know, 
well, if you are into post-apocalyptic fiction, what are the what are the covers and what do they look like and what are the top-selling ones? That is what you typically find in one mm. of our reports. And then we start also including book descriptions of top books to give you a, a feel of what's, what's in there. So I, I thank you, by the way, for allowing to show this a little bit because um, what we see at, at, at Kalytics Joe is very much, you know, people shy away from it, you know, like, oh my God, numbers. But once they see how much time it can save, they, you know, jump on board. So we have a 100% customer satisfaction uh, guarantee. So, you know, if you cannot work with it, you get your money back and you can mm. always have a look. So that, that's what we do these days for a living, trying to no, help. It's, it's really interesting. Publishes. It's really interesting. You know, I think, um, you know, having been in this industry on the business to business side and, you know, a lot of, a lot of the hard work is in getting the, the material digestible and unbiased. Right. And I think you've right. done a really good job at that for the marketplace is understanding who's going to be reading this stuff and making it relevant to them. It, uh, you know, I was looking at some of the stuff you have there and, you know, like I said, I tell people with my own courses, like, don't take my course until you get a book in the market. But I would actually say it would be worth dropping, you know, 30, 40 bucks with you to do this, to kind of prime the pump with what's going on in the marketplace and understand maybe, maybe having some of this information adjust your story and your series enough to make it successful right the the inherent yeah. story is still your inherent story but because how you're positioning in it and knowing that hey that cataclysmic event should be emp versus virus has this influence that's important stuff i mean if you're an author you might be like i really i really don't i'm not personally attached to whether it's a atomic bomb going off or a biological warfare i just it's what happens afterwards it, it, exactly right, and and the it's interesting that you mentioned these use cases that we would say as consultants. I, I always tell people, look, either you have a clean sheet of paper in there before you now uh, spend the next two years of your life writing your memoir right, or doing whatever book project to the detriment of your of your marriage because you spend <laughs> all your time in front of the PC instead of with your wife. <laughs> you may want to have a look at that data, whether you are in afterwards able to afford the Ferrari or the dinners or the nice holidays to, to make up <laughs> for the time, to make up for this spend. So one use case is clearly to, to before you start the project. The other one is you're already in the project, and there it's exactly as you say. We have authors who, who, who look at the data and say, hey, I'm right here in the middle of plotting, and here it goes. And they can still adjust, right? So no problem, and it's very often exactly like you say. You know, I don't care whether I call that person a detective or a superintendent, and, or this or that. But my God, you know, these type of books earn five times more royalties. Something seems to resonate more with the reader than doing the other thing. Um, then the third use case, if you go towards the launch, and then obviously you are interested in covers and keywords and what are tactically the best categories. That's where the database and the reports come into play. And then we have all these people who already have their selected genre in a portfolio of books. And for them, it's more like, well, what is the next project? Or how do I breathe life into the backlist? Even down to, uh, we had some cozy mystery authors who say, well, I'm sitting on 20 stories. I can turn these into witches, you know, Almost with a search and replace <laughs> in, a, in a manuscript. Well, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. But you get the idea, and 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 that's the whole point of it. You know, one thing is really the core of the story. The other thing is the marketing. But what I see, like in between, is also a bit like the paint that you give to the story. Whether it's now a witch or a you know an elderly lady, you know that's. Potentially more the pain than the core of the story, if you if you know what I mean. Mm. And there, I would always go like Coca Cola. They they test flavors. 
I think they just launched one, you know, in a long time, right? I'm sure they did a lot of testing. Uh, I hope they did before they before they launched it. And what the beauty of data is these days is you can potentially save a lot of money. You don't have to go out and actually test covers with people. You can actually look at well, well, what are the covers that sell, and then not copy them but emulate them. And that is the beauty of data we, we have today. I think we can save a lot of market research. Well, that's it. Uh, you know, um, the the material is there. We don't want anyone to get overwhelmed. But if you're serious about running a business and you're, you know, one of the hard things about being an, uh, an indie publisher is you have to be schizophrenic. You have to sometimes be the creator. Sometimes you have to be the marketer. Sometimes you have to be the CEO. And um, if you're if you're very focused when you're in those niches and you're like, okay, I got to make sure that I'm do I'm going to be the best marketer today. Having market data, right? Like what what we've walked through here is is that um, maybe for the first time in history in in a marketplace, you have the most reliable model of supply and demand. Right? I, I I would I think it's fair to argue that okay. yes yeah. Um, Fortune 500 companies pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for that kind of data, right? But like here we have it where the average Joe um, can get that data. That's great that the data is there. Are you going to use it to your benefit? Like if you don't, then you're not only kind of not doing a good job as a marketer, but you're kind of a bad CEO, right? Like you only have finite resources for your business you want to apply them in the best way possible with the most information. Sometimes it's not about trying to be brilliant. It's about trying to be less dumb. All right. That's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. Right. And, and also, and, and also what, what I would want to add there is I know many indie authors do all the stuff themselves, right? And that's where the data can help to focus you, but also the data can help you steer whoever you take on board. So, you know, if you are hire a cover designer and he comes back with 10 designs and say, well, so which one is the best one? Well, this one. Well, why? Well, because your grandmother preferred it over the other. You know, that is not how to approach it. But if you say, dear cover designers, these are the top selling covers right now. I don't want you to copy them and violate any whatever creative copyrights, but I want to emulate exactly that, you know, that is how you save a lot of time. That's how you use market intelligence to steer your resources. You have somebody to manage your keywords and ads for you. Tell them, look at these titles. You know, look at this list of authors. I want to have these authors in my AMS ads. That's what you do. Yeah, and then you get to make a choice. I know, uh, for example, I was uh, listening to an interview, and an author was saying how they did. You know, they had three or four covers made, and they went to their fan base and said which is the cover that you would buy? You don't know the story, you know it's written by me and you know this is the cover. Which is the, which is the story you're gonna buy, right? So it's purely a visual deal. And his audience picked not his favorite cover, right? There you go. Okay, there you now go. that's a piece of data. You don't have, you could go with your favorite cover. You're the, you're, the, you're the CEO at this point, you're making the decision, we're going with our favorite cover. But if your thing is, is you're, you want to set this thing up to be more successful and make more money, right, because it's a business, then you, you put your personal opinion aside and you go with the cover that the audience says they would buy the most of, right? Our, it's a choice. Our, but it, to ignore it all is, like, to your point, is, is really bad, right? Like, to help use these tools to get to a better answer. Right? Exactly. So, so you're obviously preaching to the converted. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but I, I think we all get, uh, we, we all get it. I mean, likewise, we as the, the people who are maybe more data driven also sometimes have to spend time and just, you know, grant, grant that, grant the way of working to an artist. As well right? so and and I think that's the exciting part of it where you have the the, the artist with 25,000 creative ideas in his or her head 
and mind and, and spirit. And, and then, you know, you have the numbers and the market and you have us guys who have, you know, all that brilliant advice, but have never written 20 urban fantasy novels. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, the, 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 the consultant who, uh, I don't know whether I can make a joke like this on, on YouTube, politically correct, but the consultant who knows 100 sex positions, but never had a girlfriend. Right. <laughs> so, um, but this is where it all comes together. You know, the data, the, the outside view, the creativity of the artist and, and hopefully in the end of the day, also a little bit of luck that in the end of the day, it has to strike a chord with the reader and the prospective reader market. And I think there, neither you nor I or anyone, any tool, service, consultant or artist themselves has the crystal ball and the magic silver bullet. But I think what I really love in your channel is, is that it's trying to combine those worlds of arts and business and what we do jointly, the artists and the business people together, it's not the silver bullet, but it's, I always say, increasing the odds of success. You cannot guarantee success, but how do you increase the odds of success? And I think that's what your channel is all about. And that's why I also want to say a big thank you for, for having me on your show. No, it's been great. It's been great. I really appreciate all the work you put into this. It's all. Um, well, Alex, uh, thanks again. It's been, um, even if nobody watches this video, it's been completely enlightening to me and <laughs> really helpful, but I sure will get some people that will devour this stuff. And uh, for those of you out there that are watching, that have made it this far to the end, uh, God bless your soul. Uh, hopefully we've delivered some uh, nuggets to you that you can, um, you can use to make some money with, with your books and uh, build some wealth. So thanks a lot. See you Thank later. You. Bye. Thank you.